Thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, the show for all motoring enthusiasts to discover memorable stories from Australian roads and racetracks. Today we have a very rare opportunity for an up-close look at a stunning owner's example of our feature car, still with only 300 kilometres on the odometer. We'll also have some market updates from the Shannon's auctions team. So let's take a look at the Commodore-based show car that inspired the rebirth of a Holden icon, the V2 and VZ Monaro. When Monica slipped off her jacket, maybe 200 watching men fell immediately in love with her. This was media day at the 1998 Sydney International Motor Show and Monica was the coupe we all reckoned should be called Monaro. The Monica Monica came about because Holden design boss Mike Simcoe and a small team were working on this project after hours and in such secrecy that even their wives were not told. This was in the 1995-96 time frame when Monica was a name much mentioned in the media, especially where secrecy was concerned. Mike Simcoe and a small team working in secret at night concocted a VT Commodore Coupe. What they did in essence was start with a standard VT SS. From the A pillar forward, their design was pure VT SS. The pillars themselves were raked back two degrees so that the roof above the front seat occupants was about 45 millimetres lower. But the standard VT windscreen could be retained, all very clever. The doors were 150 millimetres longer than the sedans. The rear of the coupe was 100 mil shorter than the VT. There was room for a full size spare and the rear width was right for standard VT taillights. Mark, the V2 Monaro certainly looked like a beautiful race car in waiting, didn't it? Oh, it sure did. I mean, it would have made one of the best looking V8 supercars, but the category rules at the time demanded a minimum of four doors, so the Monaro wasn't eligible. However, Holden did find an alternative category in which to race the car, and it had a very strong Bathurst connection, which I'll get to a bit later. Why didn't Holden put it straight into production? Remember the XM and XP hardtops, the first Monaro, the Charger, the XA, XB and XC hardtops, there was a common pattern. After strong initial sales, demand tailed off. It is much the same with retro cars like the new Beetle and PT Cruiser. Then in April 1999, Peter Hannenberger was appointed as Holden's next CEO. Hannenberger was determined to diversify the Commodore range and also to increase exports. He was Monica's Prince Charming. The coupe was released in 2001. Its Monaro name, a no-brainer. Supercharged V6 or V8, manual or auto. In 2004, there was a VZ version with twin bonnet scoops and dual exhaust outlets. But Hannenberger doesn't get the credit for selling Monaros in the US. This was Bob Lutz's idea. Lutz an ex-BMW petrol head executive, was appointed chairman of GM North America in 2001. He reckoned the Holden Coupe could be his Pontiac GTO. And when it did go racing, Mark, mm. yellow was absolutely the right colour, wasn't it? Sure was. Reminiscent of the original HK, in fact. But not everyone was happy about the new Monaro's return to the racetrack in the new millennium. Holden's 7-litre V8 racing version of the V2 Monaro, designed to compete in ProCar's short-lived Nations Cup Championship, was as successful as it was controversial. It dominated both of ProCar's Bathurst 24-hour races, yet in doing so, attracted criticism from rivals and fans. Its detractors argued that all cars competing in an authentic GT class must be based on the same specification as the road-going models. The largest engine available in a standard Monaro at the time was a 5.7 litre V8, but Holden was using the 8 litre V10 Dodge Viper as its benchmark. So approval to run a 7 litre or 427 cubic inch version was seen as a special favour only available to Holden. It seemed a solution to such criticism had been found in 2002 when Holden Special Vehicles revealed a road legal racing version of a 7 litre Monaro named in honour of the Holden Racing Team, 
It was called the HRT 427. However, the project had to be shelved due to ADR-related cost blowouts, leaving the nation's Cup Monaro with no road-based derivative and few friends. John, all of the criticism could have been avoided if the HRT 427 had made it into production, and it probably would have given cars like the Porsche 911 Club Sport you know, a real run for its money. Oh, it would have been phenomenal. Yeah. I'm sure there were very many disappointed people when Holden pulled the pin on it. Yeah, sure would have been. I mean, it was an incredible concept. Uh, yeah. you know, a 427 7 litre Monaro, that would have been the king of all Australian muscle cars of all time. Absolutely, no <laughs> question. Yeah. <laughs> the Nations Cup Monaro was built along similar lines to a Commodore V8 supercar but with an all-aluminium V8 inspired by the Le Mans Corvette C5R and unique independent rear suspension. Not surprisingly, the rulemakers demanded that Holden keep this new 7-litre monster on a tight leash by imposing extra ballast and a low rev limit. Even so, the bright yellow beast dominated the inaugural Bathurst 24-hour in 2002, covering more than 3,000 kilometres on its way to a staggering winning margin of 22 laps. The following year, Holden returned with two cars and Bathurst legend Peter Brock on the driving roster. As expected, they claimed a resounding 1-2. But the collapse of Pro Car and Nations Cup soon after ensured the 24-hour race and the orphaned 427 Monaros were consigned to a short page in Bathurst history. Remember to join the Shannons Club, where you can connect with other enthusiasts around the country. Hello, my name's Gary Beardsley. Um, the car uh, is an, a 2005 CV8Z Monaro and I love it to death. This is one of the last Monaros that, that the General has, has made. The car um, has a life of comfort. It's only done 300 kilometres, so it is terribly tight. Um, and it, it handles around a corner as good as, as good as you can want. It's very much a genuine motor car. This is how it was made, and this is, it, it hasn't been touched, tampered with in any way at all. It's fitted with the 5.7 litre EFI V8 engine. It's got some other creature comforts. It's got the sunroof. It's got the, uh, the sat-nav, but in essence, this, this is how it was made. It hasn't been touched, and other than lots of polishing, this is, this is the original motor car. It's brilliant. We've, we've been with Shannon's for it's, it's, it's somewhere around 20 years. They always seem to embrace what I'm doing. I never have a problem with the understanding of that passion. Yeah, they're, 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 their passion is probably, it's like ours, yeah. They're a good crew. In trying to keep this as only a 300 kilometre motor car, and I've purchased another one of these. It's a 2003. Doesn't quite have the same handling abilities as this one does, but I still really enjoy using it and I can keep this exactly like it is. Something that I still want to treasure and keep it like it is for as long as I can. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon is here with a market update on the V2 and VZ. Monaro, welcome, Chris. Hey, John, how are you? Welcome, mate. Hey, mate. It's interesting, uh, we talk about that, you know, when a new model comes out, people, collectability-wise, are always interested in the first model. So, yep. you know, when this yep. first came out, we had the CV8, the V8, and the CV6, CV6. of the supercharged V6. How are these things going in terms of collectability these days? Look, I think there's a there's really good little market for it mm. uh, out there. And, um, you know, even though the cars have come down in price over the years, mm they're an affordable modern classic as such to get into. Um, mm -hmm. and, and look, I think my, my preference would be the CV8, mm -hmm. but there is a market for both. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, very affordable to get into. The cars still look very fresh. It still the, looks the shape great, looks it? great. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and I think that's probably uh, you know, part of the attraction of a car still. Yeah. And the, the Coles to Newcastle, the sending Holden Monaros to America as Pontiac GTAs, yeah, that's yeah. a fabulous story. We could spend several episodes yeah. just talking about mm. that. But because the safety regulations are even more stringent in the US, 
they had to make a lot of modifications to the to the car, didn't mm. they, to, to qualify it as a Pontiac right. GTR? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, you probably touch on it, but I think the fuel tank was moved from yep. underneath yep. to behind the seat yep. area. There's probably a There's few others a few that changes. were done. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And I wonder, would that be a collectible one day? Like a left-hand drive sold in the US, Pontiac GTA coming back here, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be quite an interesting collectible car. We might be able to drive it in right hand, in left hand drive at that stage. But uh, yeah, look, I, you, you think so. I think, you know, there were a lot of special models that were limited editions that were built mm. across the production of Monaro, so. Are they more sought after than the common or garden run of the mill ones? You would have to say so. I, I think that's what, you know, we mm. see that across other models and other ranges. So I think the same would probably replicate itself. You yeah, know, well, the CV8R yeah. uh, and the CV8Z Z, in the VZ right. model, that was a special edition. I'm sure mm. that would have to be pretty desirable. And also we, we must touch on the Holden Special Vehicles versions because that's they right. built... Yeah, the GTO the GTA, and the GTS. And, the GTS. and then yep. the Coupe 4. And the Coupe, what, Coupe and 4. I really thought that was going to take off and would yep. account for most of the sales. But sales were very, very slow. But now it's highly sought after. Well, very rare. I mean, the, cost, the cost of a car, I think, is what probably uh, yes. saw that a bit. Uh, but yeah, they didn't, build, they didn't yeah. build many. It was like no. you know, 100 no. or so all-wheel drive. Yep. But that yep. makes it very unique as a collectible, doesn't it? That would be one of my picks, I think, mm. out of you know, out of the, the whole range. I think the Coupe Four is one to look for, uh, and then the GTS, the GT, GTO, uh, GTO LE, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. some of the you know, obviously the CV8 Zs and Rs, you know, they're the ones to probably look for. Yes, yep. yes. Mm. Do you see a sort of a packing order though, like in terms of collectability, are the HSV coupes going to be worth more than the standard Holden Monaros, or, or the other way around, or is it perhaps even even demand? <sighs> Look, I think there will be a price point. Uh, mm. It will come down to a price yeah. point. Uh, what I can see right now is probably the uh, the HSVs might probably carry a bit more value at this stage. Mm. But it's hard to say what's going to happen. I think the yeah. Coupe yeah. 4 is already on the way up. They are, mm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today, Chris. Thanks, Thank you. And remember, you can get all the latest market news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like a memorable competition image of the V2 Monaro, visit the incredible archive at autopix.com.au. John, looking back at the Monaro, this reborn Monaro, the V2 and the VZ, it's interesting, it was under Peter Hannenberger's reign, and at that time there was a real model proliferation at Holden, wasn't there? Well, the Australian industry had perfected in the 1970s economies of mm. scale, getting the maximum number of variants out of the one basic design. Yeah. But the market did move on. And even though Holden had 20% of it mm. at the time when all this was, was going fantastic. on, and there was brilliant engineering involved, mm. there really was a bit of overreach. Mm. And the Australian consumer just wasn't ready for so many different types of Holdens, you know, crew cabs and four-wheel drive utes and all that sort of thing. Mm. But I think we're very lucky we had the Monaro and that HSV gave us the Coupe 4, mm. a world-class machine, really. Indeed, a real icon. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the reborn Monaro. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.